Hello world, Lisa Fredrickson here, your friend and computer science professor with another short screencast from javascript.info, the modern javascript tutorial. If you've been following along with my playlist, you know we have gone through many of the tutorials in the javascript language part one, as well as some in the part two where we connect JavaScript to the web page and see the responses in the browser. The last YouTube I posted was on Ninja Code, which I thought was a tutorial that everyone should read and just goes to show how brilliant this gentleman is that put together this whole website. Because I'm doing this for my introductory JavaScript class, I'm going to skip 3.5 and 3.6 given we don't cover that in my class, but do read through them. The tutorial on testing is fantastic and will give you some vocabulary about how to do testing correctly. We're also going to skip Polyfills, but do read through that as there's some great information there as well. We're going to get right into 4.1 objects, the basics. So in this tutorial on objects, I want to remind you that an object is merely a storage container. And what does it contain? It contains properties and methods. And that makes it a special storage container because arrays and primitives cannot store methods. We're going to use this tutorial to compare these three storage locations, a primitive, variable, an array, and an object so that you can see how rich an object is. And I also want to remind you that you've already been using objects throughout this playlist and throughout this tutorial in that we've used the window object and three of its methods, alert, prompt, and confirm, talk back and forth to the user. If you've followed my playlist, we've rolled up to the document object, the web page itself, and all the elements within the document, which are objects of the document object, and we've also used console.log, which helps us display information about the script as we're running it. I've created one, two, three little primitive variables, fname, lname, and title, and assigned them to string. Then I've created a new function called greeting, and it's going to simply console log hello, the text, then the title, which is going to be professor in this case, plus a space, plus the lname variable. We're just going to run that code and then run the greeting function here in the console and we see hello professor Fredrickson from line 12. Let's compare and contrast using primitives to using an array. I'm going to put all of these strings in an array called prof and I'm going to create another function called greeting2 and this time pull the information out of the array instead of out of these primitives. My second greeting then is assigned to a function and it's going to console log out hi and then prof in the second index position, 0, 1, 2, professor, plus a space, plus prof 1 in the first index position. That's going to be Fredrickson. Let's run that function, and it's greeting to, hi, Professor Fredrickson. So this is just a compare and contrast that you can store your information in individual variable names, or you can stuff them into an array and get the same information out. Now, you wouldn't use array for just random strings, however. We're going to study arrays later, and this isn't really a good use for an array because these positions don't mean anything. You usually use an array for an ordered list, not just random strings of information as I have here. But I'm trying to make the point that whether you use a primitive variable name or an array, all they are are storage locations for pieces of information. Now let's look at storing that information in an object. When we create an object, I'm going to call it prof1, we assign it to the object literal, and by literal we mean we are literally creating the object, goes in curly braces. Notice that the syntax for arrays are square brackets. When we create our objects, we go in curly braces. And here's the big benefit of objects. In an array, this is index position 0, 1, and 2. We can't change that. That's how arrays work. They automatically index each piece of information starting with 0. In a object, we can give that position a meaningful name. Instead of position zero, as it is in an array, we're giving this first piece of information a meaningful name. We call that a key, the F name key, and we're assigning it to Lisa. The different key value pairs are separated by commas, and because that can get very wide if it's on one line, we typically write our objects in a vertical fashion like this. The second position which is irrelevant. I could change first name and last name, switch these up because we have meaningful names now to give them. And I use the last name of Fred and the title of friend. And then here's another big advantage of objects over arrays. An object can store a function. And when we assign an object, key can be assigned to a function. 
And when we do that, we call that a method of the object. So the big advantage of storing this information in an object over an array are that each piece of information is given a meaningful name and we can create methods that apply to that object. Let's try and run that and we refer to that method, that greeting method of this object using the dot operator. And then we run it like we would run any other function with the parentheses, prof1.greeting, hi, first name, all these exclamation points. So in one object, we can store and describe the information and create methods using the function keyword that are things that that object can do. Now, if we want to refer to anything in this object outside of the object, we can do that as well. Here's greeting three, and I've assigned it to a function. It's going to console log hi, and then prof1, which is this object, this variable name, dot title. So that'll be hi friend. Let's run greeting three. Hi friend. And here's the kicker. Once you understand that primitives store one piece of information, a string, a number, a boolean, an array stores an ordered list of items, and an object stores key value pairs and can also store its own methods, then you can use them together. And so you'll often see something like this, an array of objects. So here's the first index item of this array. So this is index zero, index one, index two, and index three. And what's in those positions? Objects. So let's see what this function list props does. Well, I'm using a for loop. I'm starting at position zero. I'm going to end it when I increments less than props length. And what's props length? One, two, three, four. I've got four items in my props array. I'm going to increment by one. And I'm going to console log out props, whatever position I'm in, f name. Let's see how the function list props works. List props run, boom. And it's pulled out the first name from each one of these objects in my array. Lisa, Doug, Kelsey, Aaron. So that's really what I wanted to focus on in objects. The tutorial has far more information about the specifics of objects that I'm showing you here. But I think once you understand that A, you've been working with objects all along because you've been working with the window, document, and console objects, the built-in objects that are available to all users simply because you're using JavaScript with a web page, B, that an object is in a storage location. It's a storage location for properties and methods. And a property of an object can actually be another object that contains properties and methods. And C, that you can combine array knowledge with object knowledge to provide an array of objects you are really getting somewhere. An array of objects is a very common way to pass information into a script because arrays have so many methods that are available to them and objects are such a powerful and descriptive way to store information. Thank you.